Good morning, YouTube. It's Saturday morning, June 23rd, which means it is the day for our next full garden tour. I have usually done these videos at around 6.30 a.m., but when I woke up this morning, um, it was storming horrifically. I mean, just a terrible thunderstorm. So it's about 8.30 right now. It's a little later, but nice and overcast. And then we are about to go check out a very, very happy and well-watered garden. I haven't actually harvested much of anything out of the garden for about the last 36 hours. Um, because I knew we were supposed to get some really bad storms and I wanted to make sure that um, everything was tied up and supported that needed it so I didn't get any broken plants during heavy rain. So we might find some really large fruits today because generally speaking this time of year, especially when there is rain, which we had rain a couple days ago and um, it's hot. So things grow so fast. They literally just like, they can go from normal size to incredibly large to unusable like in the matter of a day well, i was gonna check how much rain we got but my rain gauge did not make it through that storm standing upright i have another one down here but my kids play with it so I think it's probably pretty unlikely that we got three inches of rain. Two and a half, maybe. I don't know. Oh yeah, things are looking really big. All right, let's go to the beginning and check it out. I've got my hod to gather in and I've also got, I almost slipped in the mud. I've also got my roux apron. Um, which these two things I use regularly. I guess if you had a smaller garden, you could get by with having either, but I like to have both. So in this first row, these are supposed to be like a bush winter squash. And if you notice, um, they're definitely vining, which it's cool. They have space to do that, but I thought it was kind of funny. Look, there's a baby. This is a, a sweet dumpling variety, and uh, the packaging of the seeds I got said it was a bush, but clearly not the case. Which I actually don't mind. I think it'll be really cool. I'm gonna move this cattle panel out of the way. We're actually gonna go ahead and put up the arch tomorrow with this. Um, we haven't done it yet because we weren't able to do it during the hours that it would be easy to video. We really wanted to do it to show you guys, but, um, that that vine is gonna grab hold of the fence here crawl all over it'll be really neat looking and these squash are also really starting to take off i need to get my trellis up for these um asap as well i did a video when i planted this row of sunflowers most of them did not do well probably has something to do with um how much my kids walk down here there's a few little a few little scragglers here on the end i thought about replanting them but the weeds are pretty intense so i was just gonna not so we could weed it man my structure's leaning hard that was a hard rain we had i might have to see if i can Sink that in a little more. This ground's really soft. These tomatoes are looking good though. We put these in a lot later than the ones in the ground. So the ones in the ground um, are starting to put off ripe fruit and these are really just starting to set most of their fruit. I think it'll be really good that we kind of unintentionally succession sowed um, tomatoes this year because of the fact that it's so hot here, like we're already in the mid 90s and it will get more hot, the tomatoes really start to struggle. I think it'll be interesting to see how they do at different stages and I think it may help us stay in ripe fruit longer. 
to have them, you know, like staggered in the age of the plant. The little plants on this end bed are starting to fill out some, but it's really not planted very densely. And I'm waiting to fill it in with some cooler weather varieties here in a couple of months. So when I go to plant for fall, these two beds are gonna get the most attention. And really some of that third one, there's some space over on the other side of those tomatoes because this is where the most spaces are. We've got a lot of melons starting to set fruit. That is the, um, let's see. I'm pretty sure that's a Charleston gray melon. You can kind of see the weeds are a little intense in our rows here. But the melons are starting to sprawl. That one got a little sick. I think I'm going to go ahead and tear it out. I'd say so far this year, my greatest struggle as far as disease or pest goes has been bacterial wilt from cucumber beetles where you have just a completely healthy plant you notice cucumber beetles on it you know you're picking them off but there's way many of them and then the next thing you know your plant looks like this where you know i mean just like large portions of it are just wiped out and the bean plants down here are starting to get some blossoms Aren't oh, those beautiful? Got blossoms in different shades of purple. Oh wow, look. We have squash. So here is a cockazelle squash, and I told you we might find some big fruits. Um, I noticed that this had some flowers on it the other day, but that's a pretty that's a pretty big thing. And um, there's one more small one on here, and I'm gonna check on it later tonight and maybe let it get a little more size before I cut it. There are a lot of different types of zucchini, and uh, you know, other than the typical, um, you know, dark green, what you're used to seeing in the stores. Now, that is a Black Beauty zucchini, is typically what you're, you know, what people are more used to, and it is one of my favorites. I still grow it. However, there are a lot of really different, um, neat zucchini squashes or, you know, what we know is, you know, like what we are used to with yellow squash. These are all just different summer squash varieties. Uh, that's Cocazel. There's one called Caserta. Um, Marrow squashes comes in yellow and white. And they're all so easy to grow. Now, most people that I know at some point lose their squash to pests. There's vine borers, um, different wilts, different things like that. So like I said in the video last week, we, I succession sow those and because they only take 50 days to start producing fruit. And that way I just make sure I've got new plants reaching maturity, you know, staggered out throughout the season. That other benefit of that is, is that you get to try lots of different kinds without being overwhelmed by them. Because squash, is kind of hard to preserve. Um, you can freeze it, but it's not really the best in the world. Um, usually when we freeze it, what we do with it after that is use it for things like casseroles or breads, like zucchini bread. But as far as like just sauteing it stuff after it's frozen, it's not great. We use it to eat fresh make breads and then if we freeze it it's for the purpose of using it as casseroles you can use it in replacement of noodles by getting like a special tool that um makes i don't know people call them zoodles like zucchini noodles um i i love carbs so i don't need a lot of zoodles down here on the end, our sunflowers are coming around. Again, they're a little spotty. You know, I used all the sunflower seeds that I had in packages. And of course, you can just plant black oil sunflower seeds and they will grow into sunflowers, which is evidenced in our horse pasture because there are sunflowers growing all over the place because we feed them black oil sunflower seeds. And so they're coming out in their manure and growing. But this is just a mix because over the years I had accumulated a lot of packages. So some of the seeds were very old. I'm not surprised to see that about half of them didn't come up. But I am very pleased 
that uh, the ones that came up are doing so well. I'm really excited to see all those sunflowers, big, tall, and blooming. It's going to be really beautiful. Down here on the end, these runner beans are really looking good and healthy. Um, and here on the other side, I've got some tomato plants. This one, I've not pruned a single branch off of this plant. I've just let it do its thing, really just because I was curious about what it would do. As you can tell, it's really huge. It's relatively healthy for having such a little airflow. I'm kind of seeing a little bit of browning in these bottom leaves. But it's got a couple of fruits on it. I'm just mostly curious to see how that goes. That's a white beauty tomato plant. And I have a few other that need some stakes. Just haven't gotten. This bed's been wildly neglected. Um, these are all young tomato plants on this fence that I need to come out here. I'll probably come out here today and go ahead and tie them up to the fence. Here we've got more beans setting pretty dark purple blossoms. These are um, called a, it's Blooming Prairie. And this is a really neat variety um, if you are a seed collector. If you look up Blooming Prairie Bush Beans, um, they're a purple snap bean, so you eat them fresh. But when you dry them to save the seeds, the seeds are these little uh, purple, they're like, they look like a light purple gradient to a dark purple. They're really, really pretty. I have a few kinds of seed varieties that I was given just a handful of them from friends. And like here I've got, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these little bean plants. So I won't get a ton from them. And the ones I do get, we'll probably eat some to see how we like them. But I'm probably going to save a lot of those seeds so that next year, if I really like them, I can plant, you know, a substantial row and actually get a really substantial harvest off of them. Down here, I have, let's see, there's two that came up. I've got one large one and one small one. These are edamame and... Um, I planted more than this, but only these these few came up, just a couple of them. But this one's starting to set some flowers. That's not something I've ever successfully grown before. Last year I planted it, but I planted it in an area where it got really overshadowed by the tomatoes next to it, and so it got choked out. This year that should have plenty of space. Um, edamame is one of Jeremiah's favorite things to eat, so I'm really hoping that that does well and that we get to... Um, you know enjoy that and hopefully next year I can grow more of it lots of little pepper plants down here that are pretty puny you know a little little bit of fruit setting this is an eggplant that got so ravaged by flea beetles that I thought it would surely die um, I pulled out a lot of them but it has started bringing up some new leaves so it might end up coming along after all that's a weed here are my my giant black beans that I received in the mail from a gardener in Wales and I'm really nervous about these. It would appear by their blossoms that they are some form of runner bean. They have these red blossoms which is what you know scarlet runner beans are and that might not be the case. There could be just like normal beans with red blossoms. However, a lot of the blossoms are falling off without setting any beans. I actually don't see any beans set on these plants yet. And runner beans don't do well in the heat. Which I did not realize that that's what these were when I planted them. <gasps> Look! I spoke too soon. That's a bean. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> It's so nervous. I mean, I was given like six or seven of these incredibly cool beans that this man has been cultivating in his garden in, you know, Wales for 50 years. And I'm like, okay, this is my shot. And like, I am so cautious. Like, I am seriously, I like, you know, I have a hard time making decisions. I am so cautious. And I just went for it and planted all of these. And so I'm like, oh gosh, I hope this works. I probably will just eat enough of these to taste this year and you know see how they are 
and then I'll probably be saving the rest of the seeds because they're pretty irreplaceable, honestly. I mean, like, I might be able to write that man back and ask him for some more. I saved his address just in case, but I really want to get them to grow well. I am so excited that there's a bean on that. Here's our little cucamelons on their slow start. If you remember two weeks ago, they were just barely two leaves, but that is really slow growth. However, with my other plants, they were the same way, just really slow start, and when they took off, they took off. So that concludes those first two rows, and now we can walk down the tomatoes. So I came through here yesterday with this green, um, like stretchy tie tape. I just get this at Home Depot. It's $2.97 for a roll and it's what I like to use. I've heard suggestion of like tearing up pieces of fabric or pantyhose or whatever to tie your um, tomatoes to trellises and I think those are all really great ideas. I just have a lot of plants and this is really easy. So I came through yesterday and tied up everything to make sure it's secure for the storm. Uh, this one appears to have fallen down, but I might not have tied it very well. Um, and this is really heavy. It's got a lot of fruit on it. See this orange ox heart. Now I've already pulled one fruit off of this plant that was ready. Um, these are really large. Um, it's a paste type. Ox hearts are really meaty. Here's another one that's kind of getting close. The flavor of that one was very typical of a paste tomato. It had like a pretty good tomato flavor. Being orange, it was pretty low acid. Um, I liked it pretty good. I think it would have been really good for sauce or it would have had some other flavors added to it it would have been a good base for that but it wasn't my favorite as far as like having sandwiches or that sort of thing i have had one ripe white beauty and i'm watching these others because i think they're kind of starting to turn a little bit it's hard to tell on the white ones but that is a really good tomato it's very fruity and when i first heard people use that term to describe tomatoes i was like what does that mean is like a fruity tomato that actually tasted more like fruit than it tasted like tomato it was very sweet here i've got this caspian pink which i'm gonna go ahead and pick it feels ready oh ready to me got a little bit of a blemish in it but overall that's a that's a pretty fruit I'm actually not going to put these big tomatoes in the hod or in my root apron. So I want to make sure they don't get squished and jostled and I still have a lot of harvesting to do. So I'll put it on the table with that cucumber that I picked yesterday. Back to the tomato rows. We're getting a lot of fruit starting to ripen. So far we've been coming down here just about every day and like picking one more big ripe tomato and uh, you know eating tomato sandwiches with them. We saved a few the other day. We had our friends over on Thursday night and so then everybody ate tomato sandwiches. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a tomato sandwich pusher. It's like my favorite thing. I look forward to tomato sandwiches all year and I won't eat a store tomato because they just taste like disappointment. Got a little Dr. Witchy starting to turn. These are small for this. Last year we had massive fruits from this. More like that. That one looks like it's starting to. Here's a Costelludo Genovese, which is a really fluted tomato, as you can see. Now these, um, these look like they grew from fasciated blossoms, which is where, here's an example of one. It's where multiple blossoms are kind of fused together instead of like this where that's a normal tomato blossom. You can see this has multiple fused together. And what you get with fasciated blossoms is what's called cat facing. And you see this on a lot of heirlooms, but it's where these multiple blossoms are essentially have the genetics to be multiple tomatoes, but they kind of fuse together, sort of conjoined. And you get a lot of what the ugly parts of heirlooms. And actually... I am thinking that I may start going through <clears throat> and uh, 
pulling those blossoms off. Not on my ugly food. I like the character that heirlooms bring to the table. However, when you're dealing with so much cat facing, a lot of the times you have to cut away huge parts of your fruit because it can get pockets of like, um, you know, rotten bits and that sort of thing. So I would prefer my plant to put energy into making fruits that I can actually eat all of. And these, these are all uh, pretty heavily <clears throat> cat faced, which I guess that's just typical of this variety. But over here you can see that, um, you know, there are some that are not like that. This is also Costaludo Genovese. Like that one's not cat faced at all. Here we've got, this is a Calstrally. It's beginning to turn. Now it's been very dry. And then um, the last couple days we've gotten a lot of rain, which means there's a lot of cracking going on. Now you can avoid cracking in your tomatoes by watering regularly, but you can't control the rain. So we have watered very regularly. It's been very dry, but we've maintained watering every few days very deeply. And um, <clears throat> so up until a few days ago, there was no cracking on any of our tomatoes. And then we got that first big rain. And then last night we got a lot more. So it's okay. Cracking, uh, if you gotta keep an eye on it because if you've got a really ripe tomato and they get some cracks in it, um, you know, it can start to rot. So sometimes if they start to crack, it's best to put, pull them and bring them in the house if they're like halfway ripe. But you just kinda gotta look at it. A lot of times, like here, you can see the cracking on this one. They sort of just develop scabs and uh, and they keep going. They keep growing and ripening and, and it's fine. Like you can see here's a little bit. Like those will be fine. You can even eat those places because they're scabbing over so they won't rot. I'm planning on doing a separate video giving tips on how to grow tomatoes. I'm kind of putting together all that information now because I've done a tremendous amount of research on how to grow tomatoes well. A lot of people start their first home garden and they are looking forward to eating the best tomato that they've ever had in their life. And they go to the store, they buy a hybrid variety, they put it in the ground, they water it every day. And then when they eat it, they're like, this doesn't taste spectacular. It tastes like, you know, every tomato I've ever bought. And that's because you have to do something differently than the commercial uh, growers in order to get something different than what the commercial growers are getting. I'll save a lot of it for that video because um, I would like to be able to go over it pretty in depth and we still have a lot of garden to get to this morning. However, I will tell you two things. Um, Overwatering your tomatoes is your biggest enemy when it comes to flavor because essentially what happens in tomatoes is they have you know all of these sugars and if you're overwatering you're essentially diluting those sugars however if you hold off the water it actually causes a little bit of stress on the plants it causes the roots to go deeper and um, it really condenses and concentrates the flavor in uh, the fruit another thing is is if you are planning on harvesting don't water and then harvest harvest and then water now There's gonna be mornings like this morning where we just got a whole lot of rain and I've got ripe fruits hanging on the vine So I'm gonna go ahead and pick them. However, it would be ideal if I could pick them um, And then it could have rained because essentially when your plants a little bit dry the, the sugars in that fruit are very concentrated and that's when you're gonna get that really sweet um and intense tomato flavor. Got a lot more down here on the end. This is called a money maker. And this is one that I actually really successfully pruned to one vine. Pruning to one vine, that's like a square foot gardening method and it's something that a lot of people suggest doing. And obviously you see a lot of mix in my tomatoes. The ones in the ground are not pruned that heavily. I've got some that I haven't pruned at all. However, on these rows, I have really tried to keep them um, relatively cut down. As you can see there's not a lot of branches on the lower, you know, 12 to 18 inches. I like to keep those trimmed in order to uh, allow good airflow and keep the plants from getting sick. And here's one, you know, a lot of them branched off and I didn't get it in time and I just didn't have the heart to cut off half the plant. However, 
here's one that I did prune from the beginning and you see there's there's the stem that goes all the way up there are no major offshoots they've all been cut off and we've got all of these plants growing in this one single stem all of these fruits growing one thing people often don't understand whenever reading about planting raised beds and the spacing of their plants is that when you read um, advice that tells you to space your plants really close together, that is pretty much always contingent on the fact that you are going to heavily prune those plants. Um, I actually made that mistake last year i planted according to square foot gardening uh, guidelines and then i did not prune according to those guidelines and i ended up with a lot of sickness because there was no airflow in my beds and uh, plants choked each other out we did not get the harvest that we would have gotten but gardening is a learning experience you know i think that you can garden for 50 years and still not learn everything i mean obviously you gain a lot of experience as the years go by i know so much more this year than i did last year and the year before that here are a couple of tomato plants that again um, I have not pruned heavily but I'll show you that I need to get in here and prune because if you'll see um, all of this wilt going on like that's not a good thing see tomatoes need airflow or else they get infection and right down here where this is all so thick you see all those wilted leaves if I don't get in here and prune, there's a good chance that I could just lose these whole plants. It's better to cut away large portions of your plant and keep the plant than not cut it and end up having to rip the whole thing out. These are getting pretty soft. These two plants were sold to me, um, the seeds. As Paul Robison, one is growing uh, fruits that look like Paul Robison is supposed to. One is growing fruits that are significantly smaller. So I'm not 100% sure if maybe I ended up with an accidental cross, but they are both very delicious. Back in this first bed, we've got atomic grape tomatoes. And they're really um, setting some fruit nicely. I hear a lot of people talking about being excited on that one. A lot of my barrage has started to get sick. Um, and I've just left it because it's like half the plants dying away but half still doing fine. This is my first year to grow barrage in my uh, garden beds with everything else. Um, I read that it is supposed to help repel tomato hornworms. Um, at this point, I would have to say probably not so much. Um, I guess I could take note on whether the plants that are directly next to the barrage had hornworms. But yeah, they did, because there's barrage right next to those two Paul Robisons I just showed you. And uh, we've picked a lot of hornworms off of those plants. So I don't know that that's actually true, that that actually helps. However, barrage absolutely does attract pollinators. There are always bees on the barrage. Another benefit is, is that it's a very beautiful plant. It adds color within the garden, um, which if you're anything like me, you do this not just for the um, purpose of growing food, but just because you enjoy it and the beauty of it. It just is so um, fulfilling, it's so enriching. So it's a beautiful plant and it is fully edible. Um, barrage flowers and leaves, you can eat them. They taste like cucumbers. Um, I've heard people say they put them in ice cubes and in drinks. The texture's weird. They're kind of fuzzy. So, I don't know. The only time we've eaten them is to kind of show people that you can. So we got a few more random tomatoes over here on this trellis. Um, they have not been pruned very much, to be honest, just because I haven't walked over there and done it. Hey, Daniel. Hey guys. Daniel just walked over from next door. He's gonna help me milk the goats this morning so I can do this tour for you guys since we are getting such a late start due to the storm. So Daniel recently made some major life changes 
and lost a lot of weight. So you want to tell YouTube how much weight you've lost in the last year? I've lost 118 pounds. <laughs> awesome, right? So in that, he has started trying a lot of foods that he would not have eaten before. So before this year, had you ever eaten tomatoes? No. No. And so now, what's your favorite tomato? My favorite tomato so far, man. Was it the big red one on the sandwich the other day? I don't know. I think it was the one yesterday. What was the one yesterday that I you said was know. striped? I don't know. We had a mystery tomato that was amazing. <laughs> I have no idea. I think it's a mix of some sort, but we're going to save seeds if we get another one. Cool. I should have saved the seeds of that one, but it was so good. We ate it. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it was, but it was very delicious. So anyway, Daniel's trying lots of new foods and we're super proud of him. Yeah. So I want to brag on him to you guys for a second. And here are pink peas, which I need to go through here and pick these because um, a lot of them are getting big. I've picked once since last week whenever I showed you guys. Um, I picked a handful then and then I did again during the week. They're, they're really good. The, the only thing that stinks about colorful beans, I said peas a second ago, these are beans. Tanya's pink potted bean. Um, you just eat them like a snap bean. The only thing is, is that they turn green when you cook them, which is sad. These pink beans have given a pretty nice amount every time that I've come out and picked. I've gotten a good handful. And there are more on here that um, I'm just going to leave because they're small and I can pick them later. And also, I kind of messed up and I missed some. And um, they're probably no good for eating now. They've just gotten real big and bulgy. So I'm just going to leave them on there and let them dry and um, save those for the seeds. I've done that a couple of different beans that I missed the like the window to pick them. And so I was like, well, I'll just leave those there and, uh, and, and let them completely finish growing. Because whenever you save seeds, you, you just let it stay on the vine until it, you know, the pod dries. You don't want to leave a whole lot to dry because then it'll stop putting off new ones. The more you pick, the more you get. However, if you leave, you know, like a handful, a few here and there, it's not going to stop the production of the whole plant. I just saw something cool. I was talking to you guys about fused blossoms. Check that out. That is a monster. I'm going to pull it off because there's just no way that this could functionally form into something um, healthy. But that's crazy. Look, it's already started to set its franken fruit. Look at that. See all the little tomato setting? That's nuts. Look at that thing. That would have been a huge, huge tomato with a ton of cat facing on it. It probably would not have had very much that was edible at all. Isn't that crazy? Gardening's so cool. My nasturtiums didn't do very well this year, um, but again, this is another edible flower that is a good companion plant uh, to tomatoes and peppers as far as ridding pests. Uh, a lot of people like these in salads because they're so colorful and they've got a real spicy taste and you can also eat the greens. They are also, um, you can eat them like salad greens as well. Here are Tabasco peppers. Um, which are, some of them look like they're getting pretty close to being able to be picked. There's a whole bunch on these plants. My sunflowers have started opening up in these beds. And I feel like a flipping genius for putting them there because they are beautiful. Here, the Kajari melons have just gone wild. Um, I really need to get the what I'm going to use to support them which I had produce bags in my um, cart on Amazon someone had suggested pantyhose which I had kind of dismissed for cost purposes because I was like well I need so much because I've got multiple trellises with melons and squashes however then I thought well maybe I'll do that so I can go get them locally then I haven't so here they are just to hang in and some down here are getting pretty big um, these don't get just a whole lot bigger than this. They get a little bit bigger. Um, they are heavy and they're starting to smell good. This was my first year to grow melons on a trellis and I've been kind of like hesitant on whether I like it or not. 
but now that these are setting fruit and they're doing so well i would say i do very much like it i want to get some support for these fruits and see how they finish out and see how this plant does like how it finishes but as of right now i can say i'm liking growing these melons on the trellis and the other ones i have one is a very small variety and one is getting kind of big the bigger one i'm a little nervous about but i, I think i like i think i like this method noodle beans these things just keep growing it's crazy i have picked so many noodle beans um i pickled some i found a recipe for pickled noodle beans i haven't tried it yet because when you pickle something you generally want to give it two weeks to develop its full flavor it's only been like a week so i'll let you know how that goes whenever i open it and try it but it's pretty because you just kind of curl them all up in the jar and put all the garlic and spices in the middle and um you know pour a brine over and then can them so i guess you know you'd have to like pickles to like that but i do but I've given um, a lot of these away. I'm one of the only ones in my house that eats fresh beans. Look at that pretty tomato. Okay, see that black spot? That is a hornworm poop. Which I'm not surprised to see because I haven't picked hornworms off for a couple of days. So they're probably gaining ground on me. But um, I'll put up here a suggested video we did find the trick of using a black light to um, find hornworms and it is an incredible tip it actually really works it is way easier than trying to search for them in the day and that has helped hugely as far as managing hornworm damage last year i lost so much to hornworms and this year you know they they start to show a little bit of signs occasionally we haven't when we haven't checked in several days but it's been a lot easier to stay on top of Okay, so I mentioned, um, you know, missing the opportunity, you know, the window to pick and then just leaving them to dry. Um, these noodle beans had gotten a little big. Now this is where you want to pick them when they're tender and kind of still young. And so I left them and they're just getting huge. Um, and now they're starting to change color. So it probably won't be just a whole lot longer. These really are wonderfully prolific. They have a really nice flavor. I did read, however, uh, doing research that uh, you don't want to boil them. They are best sautéed and cooked in oil because they get waterlogged really easily. I have not tried to boil them because I read that, so I was like, okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, however, sautéed, they're really good. And I'm kind of one of those people that like when I find something that works, I just like to live there. I'll put these on top of our haul at the end so they don't get mashed at all. Okay, it's time to address the okra. Now, I am having a hard time catching the okra in the right window. It grows so mind-blowingly fast that I'll look at it one day and I'll be like, that's really not big enough to pick. And then the next day it's unusably huge. So. I think I might start picking it on the smaller side because I feel like getting it small and usable would be better than waiting until it's huge and unusable. The wonderful thing about okra is that it just keeps going. I mean, these plants will be taller than me by the end of the season and they will continue to produce uh, just without apology. They just keep going. And if you look here, Every single one of these is a blossom, which means every single one of those is an okra. And here are some massive ones that I missed. Okra is something you definitely need some scissors or some snips for because it has really strong stems. This is the Texas Hill Country kind. These are a little bit big. This is probably too tough. I'm going to take it in and see what I can do with it. Um, however, whenever they are small, they're really small. I am going to go ahead and cut them today, the little ones, because I think I have enough if I cut the small ones to actually do something with it. I think that's probably about the ideal size for this variety. It's really squatty, even whenever it gets big. 
it's just a short little guy. Let's check the burgundy. This variety seems to be a little bit lighter and has not been putting on as much as the Hill Country or the Jing Orange. However, it does have really a nice, you know, long, thin fruits. They stay pretty soft and these are just beautiful plants. As you can see though, they're um, quite a lot taller than the Hill Country. They have a lot more branching and so far they've put off a lot less um, okras. This is interesting. Last year I had some of my burgundy okra right next door to my Clemson spineless okra and I saved some of the seeds and um, this is a burgundy okra and this is not. However it's not a Clemson spineless. It's got a little bit of uh, color on it so it looks like we ended up with a cross thanks to the bees. Um, I was aware that that might happen, but um, it's kind of cool. Maybe it'll be a good cross. We can see if we can do it again. If you notice here, the plant of the burgundy is uh, very red, whereas this plant is quite mixed between the two, red and green. So I, I think what happened here is definitely a, uh, a cross between the burgundy and the Clemson spineless. Here on the end of the bed with this okra is the teepee that has the cucamelons, the Mexican sour gherkins, which as you can see, they've just carpeted this side of the teepee and they have begun reaching through and taking over this side as well, where there are a couple of tomato plants growing. Um, now I have obviously not put a lot of effort into these tomato plants, they're pretty wild. And you're gonna learn about me really quickly as we progress with these garden tours into this time of year. I like to kind of see what happens, you know, like I thoroughly believe in just letting things do what they're going to. You know, I try to prune some and, you know, plant mindfully and care for things mindfully. But in a situation like this, you know, if these cucumelons take over those tomatoes, then you know, we'll just see what happens. I got enough tomatoes. I can spare a couple of plants. And honestly, my vote's on the cucumelons because these things are intense. This is only like four plants. And you know, over there at the beginning where the bean trellis is, those little squirty plants that just seem to have hardly grown at all in the last couple of weeks, these started that way. But when they took off, they took off. And look here. We're starting to get some fruits. They're not, oops. They're not quite full size yet, but they're getting close. The bigger they get, definitely the more sour. Okay, so I'm back at the Dragon Tongue Bush Beans. We harvested a lot of these last week and they are pretty loaded again. Um, You'll notice that pods that have more sun, they tend to get a little more streaked. Um, here's one that was kind of hanging over and it turned almost entirely purple. Now these, I think, are kind of starting to uh, peter out just a little bit. The foliage is sort of uh, getting a little more brittle. So with bush beans, you typically get your harvest all at once, whereas pole beans will continue to produce, you know, longer throughout the season. Now I've already picked a lot of beans off of these, so I'm gonna go ahead and pick again, and there are a lot of small ones, so I'll probably get a few more pickings off of these plants before they, you know, wrap it up and stop putting off flowers. One thing about our garden is that whenever we get a lot of rain, it tends to pull up. Um, at the end of these walkways. We're planning on putting in some drainage pipes down here because it's not really a problem in the summer when it's wet because like this will be dry within within a day. However, in the spring, whenever we're trying to put the garden in, it's just a muddy mess down here. But we'll probably wait until after this growing season to, to try to remedy that drainage issue. Here's the Jing Orange Okra, which is, um, 
been incredibly prolific so far. Okra blossoms like dry up or well, they don't dry up. After they bloom, they turn into like this mushy mess on the end of the pods. So it's kind of the gross thing about growing okra. This has been the one that I've had the most problems with the pods getting really big before I could do anything with them. Um, of course, like I said, I did not check anything yesterday, so this is really my fault. Um, I was prepared to come out and find some things too big to use. I did spend a good hour and a half or so in the garden yesterday weeding and tying up plants. But in my mind, I felt like the time that I had was better used preparing all of my tomato plants to, uh, you know, receive a lot of rain rather than, you know, picking okras and cucumbers and that. Look at the sunflowers. Aren't they wonderful? And I've just let the zinnias go here because this this little part of my garden just makes me so happy. This is where Ben picked his tomato the other day. I put a video up of that. This is climbing triple crop, which was probably one of the varieties I was most anticipatory about. And it has not disappointed. It has a wonderful flavor, has big fruits. Um, it has been one of the first to ripen and not just ripen a little. I mean, we've gotten a lot off of them and they have uh, just, I, I like this variety. I will absolutely grow this again and again and again and a lot of it. So whereas I was going to wait until um, things dried out a little bit to pick these ones that are pretty close to being ripe, I'm actually gonna go ahead and pick them before they get way more rain and split even more. Um, you can see that one got a split that did get a little yucky inside. It didn't get a chance to scab over. So I'm going to go ahead and pick these and let them finish ripening on the windowsill inside of my kitchen. Cucumbers. Got a few to pick here. These plants have been struggling a little bit with the heat this week, but they still are producing some. Okay, I've got quite a few cherry tomatoes. We've been picking them every day, and then they get eaten fresh. However, today I think I might actually have enough to put some in the dehydrator. That is why I grow so many cherry tomatoes. I love them dehydrated. We just cut them in half and uh, throw them in the dehydrator. The sugars caramelize and they are so good. These are Wild Boar Farms blueberries right here. And as you can see, the ones that are um, in the sun, they've got a lot more purple on them than the ones that are hidden there under the leaves. Here's some blue gold berries from Wild Boar Farms. My camera died while I was in the middle of picking cherry tomatoes, so I had to go up to the house and charge it for a little bit. But I did come back with coffee and a small child. We'll see how this goes. So this variety is called Isis Candy, and um, it's actually named after uh, the goddess in Greek mythology, Isis. However, obviously with current events and um, terrorist groups sharing that name, a lot of uh, seed dealers are going to calling it candy tomato but it's a cherry none of these are ripe it's they're just starting to turn it gets like orange and red streaky and it's very very sweet here we've got some pears um i've got yellow pears and red pears growing however the red pears have not started to ripen yet here we have these little they're called spoon um tomatoes this one's not super red and it will get more red but they are teeny teeny tiny tiny ones um sometimes they're called currant tomatoes as well but or teaspoon and the picture usually shows several of them so there they are next to the cherry they're they're really sweet and obviously the kids really like them just because they're so small here is a purple bumblebee um it's 
real pretty streaked. So far, um, these guys here, which they're not, this, these aren't ripe enough to pick, but this has been my favorite uh, of the small varieties of tomatoes that I've grown this year. It's called Napa Chardonnay Blush. It's a Wild Boar Farms variety, um, and I have really enjoyed it. It's got wonderful flavor. So here is a Sunrise Bumblebee. Here, you want to see the Sunrise Bumblebee right here? Whoa. Uh, that red one is called purple bumblebee. It's like that one. A yellow pear. Like that. Purple bumblebee. I like it. All right, go for it. <laughs> is it good? Uh huh. Next pink one. These are Principe Borghese, which they've been producing for a good week and a half now. I um, ate one of those. You have ate one of those. Uh -huh. That's right. Looks like something gnawed on that one a little bit. This is a neat cherry tomato. This is called Berry's Crazy Cherry. It's a wild boar farms variety and it's a multi-flora. So you see these bunches of a ton of little um, flowers turn into bunches with a ton of little cherry tomatoes. The sun has come out full force. I know I'm all over the place today. I am gonna go ahead and cut a small bouquet of these zinnias for my table. I've been leaving a lot of them out here to grow, but just keeping a little mason jar of them on the table. They last about a week, and they're so colorful and beautiful. This is for you. Oh, thank you. Let's Come cut, cut this one, Mama. Come cut that one. Come cut the cat. You want me to cut that one? Here's my little bouquet for the table. Set them there so the stems don't get broken. I noticed yesterday that some of the tomatillos are filling up their husks really nicely. Like that's all completely solid. It means we're getting really close to ripeness on some of these. I'm really excited because I've actually never successfully grown tomatillos before. Look at that sunflower. So pretty. Here's the jelly melon we've been checking on every week. Um, still no fruit that seems to be anywhere near uh, doneness yet. So the patty pan squash is still doing well. Um, actually really well as you can see. I don't think I have had a squash plant live as long as that one has and consistently produce as much. I've been very pleased. Golden Mabry patty pan squash is what that is. And um, it has been very prolific and undeterred by the heat and the pests. So that's really good. I'm gonna peek here at these collective farm woman melons. Oh, this one's starting to turn. I don't think it's ready yet, but it's definitely getting more yellow. I'm very excited to try that. And over here, these banana melons. Oh, I mean, look at that guy. It's big. It weighs a few pounds. It's get a, getting a little netting on it. Um, I'm honestly not entirely sure how to tell when this is ready. I've been trying to like read about it, but I haven't found anything super definite. Our dried beans are coming in nicely. These are skunk beans and eye of the goat. And here is my ink and cream puff squash, which obviously just got a lot of rain this morning. Um, as it heats up throughout the day, this tends to droop a little bit. In fact, all of my squashes and cucumbers are struggling a little bit in the heat. Um, you know, we are getting up into the mid 90s every day. Right now the sun's come out and even though it was a really cool morning after a storm where it's already 90 degrees. So the plants just have a hard time with that. Um, shade cloth would be difficult in this large of a garden because, you know, this is pretty much 
the fence space here is about 10,000 square feet. So, so far I've kind of just been letting them do their thing. And if I noticed that something was going to succumb to the heat, I might try to do something. These cucumber plants down here on the end seem to be doing pretty well. Oh, there's a big one. And here are some slicers. I'll let them get a little bit bigger. And more pickling cucumbers that got really big because I did not pick them yesterday. I'm just gonna fill my apron up with these. Wow, this is a lot. These are the Boston pickling uh, variety. Wow, I have a lot more beans to pick. on both sides of this. Here next to these beans are these corbachi sweet pe peppers and look at that plant, it is loaded. And those are gonna turn red and continue to curl up and they get really long and they're very sweet. Over here we've got some more wild unpruned tomatoes. Here, these are lima beans. And they're coming in nicely. Look at this. The beans are holding hands on these trellises. Wow. Look how loaded that is. They just keep producing. I've picked so many beans. It looks like it's about time to start picking jalapenos off of these plants. I wasn't sure how much bigger they were gonna get, so I've been sort of waiting, but they don't appear to be getting a whole lot bigger. So this must not be a very large variety. Yeah, they're definitely ready to come off. These Scarlet Runner beans are dropping their blossoms pretty heavily because of the heat. Um, they do have some beans on them, but I don't know how many they're gonna do. They are beautiful, um, and they're still setting a lot of blossoms, but a lot of them are falling off. These ancho peppers are loaded. Now you can eat these uh, fresh, like poblanos. You can stuff them, grill them, they're really good. Or you can dry them and grind them into chili powder, which is what I plan on doing, and it's why I planted several of these plants. This is the bed with mint and lemon balm and various weeds, which we've harvested a ton of lemon balm already. But today I'm gonna go ahead and pick some mint and make some uh, iced tea with it. I actually was at the store the other day and I saw a, uh, like a cold drink that was mint tea sweetened with honey. And momentarily I thought, oh, that sounds good. And I went to grab it and then I'm like, what am I doing? I can make that, so. Got some mint leaves. Um, I'm gonna brew these in the house, put some honey with it, cool it off, put it over ice, and see how it is. All right. I've got an apron full of these big cucumbers. I'm gonna have to rearrange my hod to make sure nothing gets crushed by these big heavy things. Pretty good haul. One of the things that you really have to go through whenever you plant a large garden is you have to change your mindset on how you decide what to eat. Uh, it's kind of like that just with the whole farm. I mean, right now we have eggs, we have a lot of goat's milk, and obviously we have all of these vegetables that you see growing in this garden. And so we have to make the conscious decision that we base our meals around those things. I get surprised how many people say, what do you do with all that food? Which yeah, there's a lot of food that comes out of this garden, but we have a big family. It's not hard to eat everything. You just have to make the decision really not to eat anything else. The other thing is, is I've just had to change uh, my mind when it comes to how I'm gonna eat. For instance, like I was talking about eating tomato sandwiches, 
I eat tomato sandwiches almost every day during this time of year, but then I don't eat tomato sandwiches for the rest of the year. So I look forward to it and I don't get sick of them because I know that before too long, they won't be an option anymore. Same thing with fresh squash. We're getting so much of this stuff that I'm sauteing it and eating it for lunch. I'll eat it with breakfast, I'll eat it with dinner. I'll eat so much squash that honestly, by the time the squash plants die, I don't mind because I'm sick of eating squash. That's just part of eating seasonally is you enjoy it because you know you're not gonna eat it the rest of the year, but at the same time, once it's over, you're okay with the fact that it's over. You're ready to move on to the next thing that's producing. So basically, it's really utilizing all of your food it has just as much to do with mindsets, if not more, than it has to do with recipes and preserving practices. It's really changing your expectations of what your meals are gonna look like so that you can enjoy what you have while you have it. Thank you guys so much for joining us on another garden tour. I will be back next weekend posting another walk around the garden while we look at how everything is doing and uh, while we harvest what we have. And in the meantime, I'll be posting more videos with just the daily happenings of the farm. Thank you guys so much. Um, I just absolutely love sharing this journey with y'all. Until next time.